Let's pray. Gracious Lord, every time we gather to worship you, we ask for your presence and your power and your grace to be here among us. And so here now especially, as we work through the Advent season, we are pleased to pray that you are with us and that you are fulfilling your promise to be with us. And so we ask that as you are with us this morning and as we worship you, that our hearts would be transformed to better serve you. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, ladies. Our call to worship this morning is Psalm 72, so it's always easier if you use the Pew Bible um, that you'll find somewhere nearby. And if you're able, please rise as we read. Give the king your justice, O God, and your righteousness to a king's son. May the mountains yield prosperity for the people, and the hills in righteousness. May he live while the sun endures, as long as the moon throughout all generations. In his days may righteousness flourish and peace abound until the moon is no more. May his foes bow down before him and his enemies lick the dust. May all kings fall down before him, all nations give him service. He has pity on the weak and the needy, and saves the lives of the needy. Long may he live. May gold of Seba be given to him. May prayer be made for him continually, and blessings invoked for him all day long. May his name endure forever. His fame continue as long as the sun. May all nations be blessed in him. May they pronounce him happy. Blessed be his glorious name forever, and his glory fill the whole earth. Amen and amen.
branch shall grow out of his roots. The spirit of the Lord shall rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. His delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. He shall not judge by what his eyes see or decide by what his ears hear, but with righteousness he shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. He shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips he shall kill the wicked. Righteousness shall be the belt around his waist, and faithfulness the belt around his loins. The wolf shall live with the lamb, the leopard shall lie down with the kid. The calf and the lion and the fatling together and the little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze, their young shall lie down together, and the little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze, and their young shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. The nursing child shall play over the hole of the asp, and the weaned child shall put its hand on the adder's den. They will not hurt or destroy on all my holy mountain, for the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. On that day, the root of Jesse shall stand as a signal to the the peoples. The nations shall inquire of him, and his dwelling shall be glorious. The sermon this morning comes from the book of Romans, Romans chapter 15, verses 1 through 7. Romans 15, 1 through 7. We who are strong ought to put up with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. Each of us must please our neighbor for the good purpose of building up the neighbor. For Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the insults of those who insult you have fallen on me. For whatever was written in the former days was written for our instruction, so that by steadfastness and by encouragement of of the scriptures, we might have hope. May the God of steadfastness and encouragement grant you to live in harmony with one another, in accordance with Jesus Christ, so that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Welcome one another, therefore, as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. Let's pray. Gracious God, we come to your word that has an encouragement to come to your word. And so we ask that as we do it, that you will give us open hearts and open minds. And we ask all this in your name. Amen. It has been said, church is the only place where we willingly and joyfully and regularly go to interact, fellowship, worship, and do ministry with people that we would ordinarily have no other reason to associate with. And that is true because the gospel attracts people from all walks of life, and those all different walks of life are as diverse as we can possibly imagine. And yet, Sunday after Sunday, these incredibly diverse people from a vast array of backgrounds gather together to sing, pray, hear the scriptures, and to interact with God and with one another. Not to mention to have their lives transformed into doers of the word. 
Understandably, when these diverse people gather together from out of all of their life experiences, there always exists the potential for tension and conflict. It is to be expected. This was certainly true in the first century, but the first century is in no wise unique. Believers in every generation have always found plenty of opportunity to disagree with one another. In our passage this morning, the Apostle Paul is alluding to the tension that naturally existed between Jewish believers and Gentile believers. That kind of tension may seem strange and irrelevant to us today, unless we think of it as racism, which is what it surely was. In the early church, racism was a huge issue. The Church of Jesus Christ began as a movement within Judaism. But because the good news of the gospel appeals to all persons, Gentile people soon found the same hope and salvation in Jesus Christ that the early Jewish believers had found. And that created some excitement. Two more socially disparate groups of people could hardly have been found or imagined. Jews had a long history of never associating with Gentiles. Jews preferred to avoid Gentiles altogether. The Gentiles were the great unwashed socially and theologically. The Gentiles had no history with God. They were pagans. They were newcomers and interlopers. But because of their newfound and common faith in Jesus Christ, Gentiles were thrown together with Jews in the same congregations. And what a mess. Talk about people who had nothing in common. But then there was Jesus. And because they had Jesus in common, they were called to accept and welcome and love one another. They had no choice. There was no other option. It was Jesus himself who had thrown them together. When Paul writes to the churches in and around Rome, he is intentionally vague about identifying who is the strong and who is the weak. He says, we who are strong ought to put up with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. He is very careful not to say who the strong ones are and who the weak ones are. And he is very wise in doing this, and that's because in times of tension and in times of conflict, both sides believe that they are the strong side or the right side. Otherwise, there would be no tension or conflict. In the early church, both Jews and Gentiles had some very good reasons to believe that they were the strong ones. Jews could point to their long and glorious history with God, and Gentiles could point to their freedom from the rules and the rigorous traditions and regulations that most believing Jews still observed. And so Paul is really saying, whatever side you're on, put up with the failings of the other side. 
caught up with the failings on the other side, and the sure and certain implication here is that both sides have failings. No matter how right we may think that we are on a particular issue, we still have failings aplenty. And that's a tough lesson to learn. It requires that we look more closely at ourselves than we look at others. And who wants to do that? Who really wants to try to understand someone else's opinion? Putting up with one another requires that we first of all recognize our own failings. Jesus said something about a toothpick and a telephone pole that we probably ought not to forget. As it turns out, the differences of opinion that separate us are completely irrelevant to the task and our task of living out our lives as brothers and sisters in Christ. If God can bring Jew and Gentile together in one faith in Jesus Christ, God can certainly unite other people who are already drawn together in a common faith in Jesus Christ. I think God laughs and then cries over our petty differences. But Paul goes on. He wants us to build one another up. Now, this is not normal behavior. Normal human behavior is to tear one another down and to hurl insults at one another. But as believers, we are called to a much higher standard than that. Instead of resorting to tearing one another, one another down, we ought to be striving to build one another up. Building up is a constructive alternative to demolition. It is here that the Apostle Paul quotes Psalm 69. Psalm 69 is a long complaint of a righteous person who has been unjustly judged. It is excellent reading for any of us who have suffered the ravages of normal human behavior. In quoting from the Psalm, Paul immediately applies it to Jesus, who certainly was a righteous person who was unjustly judged. But he does this for two important reasons. First of all, he does it to remind his readers and us that we ought not to be judging one another. But second, and equally important, he does it to drive us to the scriptures. Seemingly from out of nowhere, Paul tosses in a short dissertation on the importance of the scriptures. There is, sadly, today, a reluctance among the followers of Jesus to engage with the scriptures. Paul says, for whatever was written in the former days was written for our instruction. Instruction is a powerful word. Instruction is education. It is interaction. It implies an insatiable desire to learn as much as we can from God's word. Instruction 
leads to knowledge. And knowledge leads to understanding. And understanding leads to wisdom. Therefore, familiarity with the scriptures is a necessary and vital component to our faith. We cannot neglect the scriptures. In verse 3, Paul quotes only one half of one verse from a psalm that contains 36 verses. Can we imagine that Paul did not intend for his readers to go to that psalm and absorb the wisdom of all 36 of its verses? Of course not. He fully intended for them to go to the whole psalm and to glean instruction from it. We must learn to be doers of the word. But Paul has another reason for driving us to the scriptures. It is so that we will have hope. One of the greatest truths of the scriptures is that God most often gets things done by engaging the weaknesses and the failings of human beings who are trying hard to be faithful. God does not often choose heroes to bring about his kingdom. Just ordinary people who have a willingness to be chosen. God doesn't mind at all working with people who are broken and who have failings aplenty. What God looks for us is a willingness to be, to be instructed in his ways and a desire to act in faithfulness to his commandments. God wouldn't get much done if he could only use perfect people. Think about that. He wouldn't get much done at all. And in that, there is deep and profound hope for all of us. Finally, Paul offers up a prayer for his readers and for us. He says... May the God of steadfastness and encouragement grant you to live in harmony with one another in accordance with Jesus Christ so that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. There are two things in Paul's prayer that are very important for us to consider. First, can people who disagree live in harmony with one another? Yes, absolutely. If God can unite Jew and Gentile, then God can unite all of us. Piece of cake. But consider this, in the early church, Jew and Gentile never did quite attain or achieve unity of thought. And we may never attain or achieve unity of thought. I'm pretty sure that that is not even God's intention. Unity of heart is far more important than unity of thought. I'm not sure why we confuse the two. We may never always agree with one another. In fact, we may be sitting next to someone this morning with whom we profoundly disagree. But we are just the same united in heart, in our common faith and belief in Jesus Christ. And if we are willing to receive it, 
God will grant us to live in harmony. Harmony is God's gift to us. It is God who does the granting. Harmony is never of our own doing. We're not that good. The second thing that's important in Paul's prayer is worship. Prayer is worship. Because we are united in heart with one another, worship together becomes absolutely essential. Paul prays that we will with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is where we sometimes become confused. It is where we fail to receive the instruction of the Apostle Paul. I am convinced that in churches everywhere, trouble comes when believers confuse unity of thought with unity of heart. Trouble comes when we place more emphasis on unity of thought than we do on unity of heart. Homogenized milk is a really good thing. And homogenized church, on the other hand, not so much. If we focus on becoming an, an homogenized church, we neglect the very clear teaching of the Apostle Paul. But worse, because we have neglected his instruction, we also neglect worshiping with one another. And in doing so, we neglect our relationship with Jesus Christ. This is why Paul says, Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. If Jesus Christ has welcomed and received and accepted us, we can do no less in our relationships with one another. In this, God will be glorified, which is our sole purpose on this earth. Let's pray. God help us in all ways to glorify you. And this we ask in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our hymn of response this morning is hymn number 153. And if you are able, please rise as we sing number 153.
Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The announcements for your bulletin. First thing on my list is something I tried to do prematurely last week, and that's thank these two lovely ladies here um, for filling in for us while, while Bunny's been away. Um, thank you, Lisa, and thank you, Mary Lou. Um, we hope you come back again. <laughs> Okay, you may or may not have noticed your bulletin is a book this morning. Uh, the first thing is the need to build up the Deacons Fund. And the reason for that is uh, um, we have had uh, multiple requests um, for winter heating bills and other basic needs um, of people connected to our fellowship. And so if you can, uh, this month, uh, make an added donation to the Deacons Fund, so that we can help with food and, and with, uh, with heat and all of that, um, it would be greatly appreciated. Um, we're always looking for makers of breakfast for Sunday school, and uh, we've got our Sunday school children with us here this morning. And was the breakfast okay, kids? Yeah. Breakfast all right this morning? It was amazing. All right, that's good. So... <laughs> All right. In in your bulletins um, is a is a is a fill out form for Christmas flowers. If you intend to donate flowers for um, Christmas, some of them have already arrived, and and that's a good thing. So fill that out um, and either drop it in the offering plate or hand it to me at the end of the service. And we're still on for pizza and cookies for the twentieth, right, Rudy? Or this? Right. Okay, Christmas dinner instead of pizza for the uh, landing place, and in your Advent and Christmas schedule, special thanks to Roberta Carmichael, Elaine Caldwell, and John and Margaret Coombs for decorating our sanctuary for the service, uh, for the Christmas. Uh, also in your bulletin is a reminder that during November and December, <clears throat> we're collecting extra food for the food pantry. So if you haven't had a chance to participate in that particular ministry, um, now would be the time in the next couple of weeks to, uh, to bring us um, what you can, and we'll see that it gets to the food pantry. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for the multiple blessings of this life that you shower upon us. Thank you for the blessings of being in this place this morning, of being warm, being with your children, being with our brothers and sisters to worship you. And so now as we return to you a small portion of all that you have done for us, we ask that you would take these gifts that are truly from our hearts. And we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may
may be seated. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and he blessed it. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we'll admit that at this time of excitement and joy and hope and peace and love and the anticipation of your birth, we find it difficult to focus on your death. And so this morning, as we hold the bread and the cup in our hands, help us to be reminded that it was in your death, in the blood that you shed, that gives us salvation and that brings us to this place to worship you. And we ask this in your name. Amen. When Jesus had given thanks for the bread, he broke it and he gave it to his disciples. That same night, after supper, Jesus took the cup. Let's pray. Lord, all around us, for good or ill, is the color red. For most of us, red signifies the joy of Christmas. The coming of you into our lives as a tiny baby. And we are often taken by the cuteness of it all. And yet, when you stepped out of the glories of heaven to come and to be born into this world like every one of us, you came with the knowledge that you would bleed. That you would bleed and you would die for our lives. And so it is with gratitude, even in this season of joy, that we thank you for the sacrifice that you made on our behalf. And we pray that you would make us worthy servants of yours. And we ask all this in your name. Amen. Jesus said, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as we eat this bread and drink from this cup, we do show forth the Lord's death until he comes again. Our closing hymn this morning is number 715. If you're able, please rise as we sing. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, who alone does wondrous things. 
Blessed be his glorious name forever. May his glory fill the whole earth. Amen and amen.